Hello, I'm Matthew Hines, and I'm running for the office of U.S. Representative in Washington State's 1st Congressional District. Today, I would like to talk to you about immigration. Our story starts with our ship, which for lack of a better term, we will call the ship of state. Along with the ship of state, we will also need a crew. Here we will have our crew, the pirate captain. Together, the pirate captain sailed the seas, trading with many people from many different lands. During that time, they all lived happily together, each man as valuable as the next, at keeping the ship safe and on course, and each man sharing the wealth they made from their hard work and adventures. Then, as always happens in these stories, things began to go bad. As the crew began to increase in age, they realized that they must pass on their enterprise to their children, or there would be nothing left of the great empire and network of friends they had made from their risk and hard work. One by one, the crew of the ship brought their sons aboard. From the very beginning, things began to go awry. The children of the original crew had grown up in the suburbs. They didn't know anything about boats or hard work. Before long, these children of the aging crew, who were going to call sons of pirates, decided the ways of the old crew or their pirate fathers were not for them. Being born rich, they didn't see the sense in working hard or studying and learning about the sea. So they were always on the lookout for someone who would do their work for much less pay. Soon, the ship of state began to stop at various ports to reestablish the Sons of Pirates trading networks. They didn't understand trade, so the Sons of Pirates made a lot of bad deals, after which they asked if anyone knew anything about trade, sailing, navigation, maps, etc., etc. Often, the people they asked didn't really understand what the Sons of Pirates wanted. They just wanted a ride out of the hellhole they were living in. Soon, the original crew realized they had a problem. The people they brought on board didn't understand the jobs they were supposed to do. They didn't seem to understand the hard work their fathers were always going on about, and in some cases, they didn't even speak the same language. Upon consultation with this new crew they brought on the boat, they informed the sons of pirates in their native tongues they didn't understand how to sail a ship, and they didn't want to work for the sons of pirates unless they could bring their families. They had long since decided to return one way or another and get their families. Now they thought this was their chance to do it, and between them they realized or reasoned somebody should know how to sail a boat and do whatever it is the pirates wanted them to do. The sons of pirates did not think this a good idea at all. More people on the boat would cost more for food. More stops would have to be made, severely affecting the pirates' bottom line. At first, they said no, and we're going to kill the mutineers on the spot. But when their crew turned to walk away, they knew they had no choice. The influx of a wave of people on the boat made space and food scarce, as the pirates had previously neglected to trade for any food. The sons of pirates knew their situation was dire. Outnumbered by their new crew and their families, should another mutiny take place, they decided their best option was the old divide-and-conquer ploy. 
the sons of pirates planted seeds among the different crew about the treachery of the other crew. The crew were easily convinced of the skullduggery of their counterparts and spent much time either in open conflict with one or all three of the rival crews. This arrangement worked out well for the sons of pirates who were able to use petty animosities and the pettiness and ignorance of their workforce to keep them in line. I guess- I guess the moral to the story is, when sailing the ship of state, if you have to divide and conquer, it's probably too late. My name is Matthew Hines. I'm a veteran. I'm a veteran of the 82nd Airborne. I took the oath, and I'm here to defend my state. Congressman Susan Del Bendy has been in office since 2012, using her substantial financial resources thanks to Microsoft and her $84 million fortune, she has been able to continually maintain an office where people still have little idea what she's done. Well, she's learned to dance around and she's learned to do all the political maneuvers you have to do to keep getting reelected. Well, Susan Del Bendy, it's time for you to go.